I want to talk to you this morning about finding the will of God. Finding the will of God. Has that been a quest in anybody's heart here? I thought so. Uh, anybody found that confusing? Or, or you live in dread that you're going to miss the will of God for your life? Well, we're going to take a look at this because I feel that those of us who have walked just a little farther down the road have an obligation to make these truths clear and make them simple, understandable. What does it mean to walk in the will of God? And how can I find the will of God? How can I actually know I'm in the will of God? I hope that by the time I get to the end of this message that you will understand these things. John chapter 7, please, if you'll go there. John chapter 7, just verse 17, one verse of scripture. Now, Father, I thank you with all my heart, God, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, for your strength and for your power, your sustaining. Lord, it's all about you. It's in you. It's through you. It's because of you that we can stand, that we have anything to say. And I thank you, Lord, that all of us stand by your power and by your grace and by your mercy. I ask for an anointing this day, Lord, to override the frailty of this body. I ask, oh God, that you would speak to me and through me to every heart that's gathered here. Let your kingdom come, Lord. Let your will be done here in us as it is in heaven. And Father, we thank you for it and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Now it is true today that every person here, you have been created uniquely by God for a divine purpose. You have. There's something God's called you to do that nobody else can do in the way that you're called to do it. It's very unique. Now the gifts and callings are varied in the body of Christ, but there is a unique calling on your life. You're not just, you're not just a person to be counted as, as one of thousands in the uh, congregations of God. You have an, a specific purpose. And some of you might be getting to the place where you're starting to realize that, even if it's just a whisper in your heart, it's just something out of the ordinary. And most often, when you get to the unique will of God, I'm going to call it that for lack of a better term today, but when you get to that place where your calling is uniquely yours, it comes with a whisper in the heart. It comes with a strong, strong leading. And most often it's out of the box of your own ability. It's in an unfamiliar place. It's, you and I are called to do something we can't do in our own strength. The will of God is so important that God makes two statements concerning it in the scriptures. John chapter 7, verse 17. Now listen to what Jesus said. If anyone wills to do his will, in other words, if anybody wants to do the will of God, that's, that's your heart's desire. You're not coming to church to get God to agree with your will, as many are today. And that's what's happening in much of our culture today as we've inverted this whole thing and we've said to the Lord, not thy will, but my will be done. And we brought our will into the house of God and there's, there's no shortage of preachers that will tell you anything you want to hear concerning yourself, your own will, your vision of yourself, how you see your future playing out, telling you wonderful things about yourself. But reality, the reality is that it's really just me taking my will and asking God to bless it. Make me a, a better this, make me a better that. But Jesus said, if anyone wills to do his will, you remember his prayer in Gethsemane, Father, if, if there be any other way, if there's any other way this can be done, could we do it that way? But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Now here's what it says. Jesus said, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. If you have it in your heart to do the will of God, you will understand truth. You will know what truth is. You will know that voice that says, this is the way, walk in it. All my life as a young Christian, even as a young Christian, I wanted to do the will of God as much as I didn't fully understand what that was going to finally play out, what it was going to look like, I, but I wanted to do his will. And I remember coming into churches as a young Christian, sitting in the audience, looking at the preacher preaching, I was, and thinking, how in the world could these people be sitting under this kind of a message? Don't they see how off track this is? Why don't they understand doctrine? Most times it's because they don't will to do the will of God. 
People just simply want to go to church. They want to be blessed. They, they want their finances to increase. They want their influence to increase. They want a bigger piece of the pie. And uh, they'll come, but they don't really want to do the will of God. And when people don't want to do the will of God, the first thing that comes into their situation is doctrinal confusion. And that's why there's so much doctrinal confusion today in our society, because there's so many who really don't want to do the will of God deep down. It's like, Lord, if it fits in my parameters of what I think the will of God should be, then fine, I'm in. But if it doesn't fit my parameters, I don't want to hear it. And the next thing that happens is confusion starts to reign. And there's, a, there's an inability to discern truth. But thank God, the prophet Malachi tells us in the last days there will be a returning to doctrine. There will be a returning to truth. There will be a return to discernment. People will know in the last days, these days that we're living in, who serves God and who doesn't, who speaks for God and who's not speaking for God. In Daniel, in his book of chapter 11, Daniel talks about a day very similar to ours when calamity begins to break out on the earth and evil begins to abound. But Daniel makes an incredible statement. He said, those who know their God will be strong and do exploits. In other words, they'll be doing things it's not by human might, it's not by human power, but it would be by the Spirit of God. There'll be something being done through them that only God can do. And folks, that's where we are now. We are right back to where the church began. The church began in a society that was against Christ. The church began at a time when the people of God were being marginalized, ridiculed, and the society at large under Rome was glad to be rid of this nuisance called Christ. But those people went into an upper room and I have no doubt that when they began to pray, their prayer was not my will, but thine be done. Oh God, show us the future for each of our lives. Show us, Lord God, what you have for us. And when they came out of that upper room, every man, every woman, every young person was speaking of something that was not humanly possible to achieve. They had found the unique will of God for each of their lives. Every person speaking something different about the future and where God was going to take them. That's my assumption. Everyone speaking of these mighty works of God, doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is where the church began. And by God's grace, this is where the church is going to finish before Christ comes for us again. I believe that with all my heart. Also in John chapter nine, I love this because I call it the testimony of the blind man. In verse 31, he says, now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. It's so important. If we're willing to do the will of God, not only will we understand doctrine, but God says, God will answer our prayers. And that was a blind man who gave that testimony to the religious leaders of his day. Ephesians 6, 6, Paul says, we should do the will of God from our hearts. There should be a prayer here this morning in your heart and in mine that says, God, lead me to what you have for my life. Not what I think my life should be, but you lead me and you take me to that place where my life is going to bring glory to you. I don't want to be just a number in a pew somewhere. I don't want to be just counted in the millions that have made it across the finish line into eternity, but I want my life to count for something. I want you to carry me, oh God. I'm going to pray and I'm going to start asking you for things, Lord, that only you can give to me. And I believe that you're going to hear my prayer because I want truth in my heart and I want my life to matter for something in eternity. The will of God can change. In my own life over the years, the unique things. Now, these are the things I speak about that are strictly for me. It's my calling. It's, it's a direction for my life that's not necessarily indicated in a line or verse in the Bible as some other things are. But it's something God is call, calling me to and it has changed over the years. It has taken different turns. But in between these points of my life, I call them the, the unique will of God, that which is strictly for me. So I'm gonna draw a distinction now between the unique will and the revealed will of God. There is a difference. Now the unique will of God is what I am, God has called me to do for him exclusively. 
That's the unique will of God. That's something that God set you apart for, for your life. But there's also a revealed will of God, a practical will of God. And it's that part of the will of God which is clearly known and to which all of us collectively are called. For example, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Paul says, this is the will of God. This is the revealed will of God. You don't have to go searching all over the place. You don't have to get mystical about it. It's right there. That's why you need to read this book. You need to read Psalms, Proverbs, Matthew to Revelation. You need to read it as if it's a, a lamp for your feet and a light for your path. You need to read it as if it's an x-ray machine that shows you your heart and then gives you promises. The will of God is clearly revealed. Take your concordance, look under the word will and just study it. The will of God is clearly revealed in the New Testament. There are so many things that in the revealed will of God, it's the, it's the common revelation. It's, it's an understanding. You don't have to become spooky in the kingdom of God and walk around just, oh, show me your will, show me your will. His will is here. His will is clear. And remember, I'm going to bring it back to the beginning. If you want to do his will, truth becomes known. Doctrine clears up. The fog lifts. And if you want to do his will, your prayers start to get answered. This is the will of God that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Let's start right there, especially in this generation, this society. Walk away. Turn it away from it. Ask God for the strength to live a holy life set apart for him. 1 Thessalonians 5, this is just another example, verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything. For the home you're in, the marriage you're in, the job you have, the family you're part of, give thanks. This is the will of God. Instead of constantly praying, oh God, get me out of here and I'll serve you. Get me out of here and I'll love you. Get me out of here. Oh God, there'd be no greater worshiper than me. Just get me out of this place. The Lord says, no, that's not my will. How can it not be your will to get me out of here? No, he says, my will is that you learn to give thanks where you are. You're going to win the victory where I put you. See, this is the will of God. You don't have to go searching for some needle in a haystack. It's clearly revealed. It's not hidden. It's very plain if, you're, if you are a student of the word of God. It's there. So many People I've known over the years have sat and waited for this unique calling of God, this, that which sets you apart from others, may I put it that way. All the while, ignoring the will of God that is clearly revealed. Ignoring it. Walking away from it. And then many times that's why their doctrine becomes confused and their prayers go unanswered. They can actually come to the conclusion, I don't, God doesn't speak to me. I don't believe in this whole thing. And they become so confused. But the bottom line is they, they didn't want to do the will of God, really. They wanted to be supernatural. They wanted to be extraordinary. They wanted the crowds. They wanted to raise the dead, lay hands on the sick and have them recover, speak in tongues, all the rest of it. But they really didn't want to do the will of God. I'll give you another example. Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. I remember the first time I read that, ever, I blurted out, oh, right, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> Paul was single after all. <laughs> but it is the will of God. When we ignore the will of God, the revealed will of God, don't, don't, don't be focusing on being a great missionary or preacher if you don't love your wife as Christ loved the church. If you're not willing to be given for her, then put down the illusion of this unique thing coming out of heaven to your life one day 
when you're ignoring the revealed will of God. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, that's your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel. That does not mean she's weaker than you. It means that God has placed her under your care. As being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. It's the will of God that we learn to speak the truth. After all, this is a kingdom of truth. We represent the one who said, I'm the way, the truth. We have to start speaking truth. We speak truth in the marketplace. We speak it in the workplace. We speak it in the secret place. Truth has got to become the bedrock of our lives. It is the will of God to speak the truth. Even when you give your testimony, don't add a little bit to it. Remember one guy was sharing his testimony somewhere in Canada and a friend of mine leaned over and said, that's a testimony, that's not a testimony. <laughs> be loyal. That's the will of God, to be loyal. To be dependable, to show up. And when things don't go right, not to quit. Be loyal in the workplace as an employee, showing up on time and leaving when you're supposed to, not before. Be loyal. Learn how to be loyal. That's the will of God. Be helpful. That's the will of God. Be concerned about others. That is definitely the will of God. Be concerned. Reach outside of your own life and sphere, struggles, trials, concerns, desires, and ask God for a heart to, to care about others. Be hospitable. That's the will of God. That means you let people inside your three-foot bubble that you and I like to keep around ourselves. We are not afraid to ask somebody to go for a coffee or even to come to our house if, if we know that's a reasonable thing to do. Be faithful and dependable. Don't be a person of just convenience. Doing the will of God if it feels right or you feel good, but not doing the will of God when it's raining outside or snowing and it's just too long a journey to take. I could go on for two hours through the scriptures and it proved to you the will of God is not hidden. It's not some needle in a haystack. A lot of people have that viewpoint of the will of God as if, as if God takes a needle and says, hey, Gabriel, come here, look at this, watch this. I'm going to drop it in a haystack. Be fun watching Brother Jones or Sister Jones try to find the will of God. And we're, we're praying and saying, oh God, show me your will. Oh God, show me your will. And the, the will of God is, is so clear. It's not debatable. It's not hidden unless we want it to be hidden. And when we don't want to do it, then doctrine becomes confused and prayers start to go unanswered. And while we're doing the will of God, while we make the choice to just read and obey what we read and trust God for the strength to obey it, while we're doing the will of God, then suddenly things that are unique to each of us start to find us. And this is really key because I want you to hear this. I have never found the will of God for my life. The will of God has always found me. There's a huge difference. Remember to the church of Philadelphia, the Lord said, behold, I, I set before you an open door. I set before you. The will of God throughout the years has, as I did the practical, the unique found me. I, I did what every man is supposed to do. I did what every believer in Christ is supposed to do. I walked in the way as best as I knew that all who are called by the name of Christ are supposed to walk. And as I, I began to walk that way, then things that are not revealed necessarily line by line or word by word in the scriptures. Things unique for me started to unfold. Strong impressions of the heart that wouldn't go away. And I've got to be honest with you, most of the time, the will of God is not something I wanted to do. Start a Bible study in a little country church in the middle of nowhere. Drive home, drive, get up early in the morning, 
feed the animals, because I used to have a farm, feed all the animals, go into work, drive 36 miles into work, work an eight hour shift, drive 36 miles home, feed the animals, tuck my kids most times into bed and then head off to do a Bible study after that, another nine or 10 miles, sometimes on snowy nights where it was difficult to drive down a road that there was no houses. But as I was faithful to what God called me to do, suddenly the unique will of God began to be unfolded. Strong impressions that just don't go away. Then the group of people at that Bible study said, hey, we're a church. There's been no testimony in this area for 100 years, 40 square miles, no testimony of God that we were aware of. We're a church. And then I remember saying, well, if you want to be a church, then I'll go find us a covering and a pastor. I went to a denomination that was in our country at that time and met with the leader and said, this is what's happened. We're, we're in this, we're in this uh, area. We formed a church and uh, I'd like uh, you to get us a pastor if you can and a covering. And he said to me, are you willing to pastor this church? I said, not on your life. No chance. <laughs> no, sir. I've already got a career. I'm doing very well in my career. And I was on a board one time of a large church and I'm not interested in that. I've seen some of the inner workings and I just, please just get us a pastor. That's all I ask you to do. And, and so he told me a search was being conducted and so I'm preaching in this hotel. That's the only building in the whole town that would take us. They kicked us out of the high school, broke a contract with the city hall there was a strong religious spirit that dominated the area and they had us kicked out of every, every building in the area. And we're, the only place left that would take us was the hotel in the middle of town. It didn't have a very good reputation either. We had to turn over the girly posters and empty the ashtrays and <laughs> the children's church was in the men only room and uh, it was uh, quite the place. And there was wagon, I had an organ player here with this, all kinds of cigarette burns on it bunch of wagon wheels in the front. If you wanted to get saved, you had to climb over wagon wheels to respond to an altar call. And we were packed out. Folks were standing right to the back. It was awesome. And then the owner of the hotel, it was a lady that with a very questionable reputation, started attending the services in her negligee on Sunday morning because she lived in the building. And she sat in the front row And she, she was usually a little bit inebriated and she would, she'd be talking to me while I was preaching. Oh, stop, you're ruining my life. Oh, stop, stop, you're getting through to me. She'd cry and cry. And then one day the hotels in Canada are supposed to be closed on Sunday, but we got, we're packed to the rafters. People are shouting and singing, it's just awesome. The police come to the door and she's the one who answers the door and tells them we're having church. I don't want to pastor this church. <laughs> I have agreed to hold it for about six months till they could find a pastor. But the whole time, the will of God just keeps, see God doesn't just tell you once and walk away. Oh, well, you had your chance, you blew it. I gave you a day, you didn't quite agree with me. No, the will of God just kept coming back and coming back and coming back. And I was preaching to others about give your all to Christ, walk with God, trust him, believe him. And the more I spoke it, the worse I felt inside because I knew my own heart. I wasn't willing to obey him. And the thought of pastoring this group of people just would not go away. And one day I looked, I was preaching my heart out. I looked out the window. There's a little brown sparrows in the driveway in the middle of winter. They're pecking at the snow and there's nothing there. It's just snow. And the Lord said to me, can you not trust me with your future? Can you not trust me with your family? Can't you trust me? to look after you. I look after these sparrows. Can you not trust me? I didn't want to hear that. I had a good job, I had a good career. And so finally one day we were, I was in a mall and I was so fighting against God. The will of God will come, the unique will of God will come, but it's not always what you want to do. And I'm walking through this mall with my partner. At, at this point I was working in, in criminal intelligence in the police department and I was always forgetting my gun. <laughs> and so my partner and I are walking through this mall and, and it, it, it just some unsavory characters came into the mall. There was a bank there and, 
And it, it, just, it just doesn't really look good. And he turns to me and says, you do have your gun today, don't you, on you? And I said, no, I forgot it in my locker again. And right in the mall, my partner, an unsaved man, he says, you are called to preach the gospel. He says, Carter, you're a nice guy, but your heart is no longer here. Your heart is in another place. And he says, I'm telling you, man, you got to go and do what God is calling you to do. It was the unique will of God for my life. Not the, not the revealed, but the unique. I had done the revealed as best as I knew how. I can honestly say I don't think there was a line I ever read that I didn't want to obey. It was the unique will of God that gave me trouble. And then I remember going back to that pastor and said, God's been speaking to me to pastor this church out in the wilderness in this hotel. And I said, if, if you want me, you can cancel the search. He said, there has been no search. He said, I knew you were the pastor. <laughs> And the unique will of God has led me into many places throughout my life. And it's sometimes it has changed. There's no way I ever could have known that I would end up in New York City. I started in children's church. Did you know that? I was a shusher. That's in the Bible. You can, you got to search, but you'll find it. Pastor Teresa taught the children and I shushed them. Shush. <laughs> Shush. I would clean the carpets. We would have a Bible study in the country and I would clean the carpets, take out the vacuum when everyone else was gone. When I started pastoring in a small church in Canada, I would wash the floors every Monday. I would just do... See, a lot of people are lazy. And they expect that this glorious visitation of God's going to come down one day and they're going to be a great evangelist. If you were starting a corporation today, would you come to me and say, Pastor, I'm starting a company in New York City. I want you to find me the five laziest people you've got in Times Square Church. <laughs> you wouldn't do that and neither would God. We, we, have to, we have to win our secret battles as David did in the wilderness. We've got to fight those giants that try to stop us from doing the basic things that are hidden. We've got to fight, we've got to win, we've got to, we've got to walk in, in those hidden places and do the will of God when, when there are no audiences. Do the will of, the will of God. A lot of, a lot of preachers get put into the public eye having not really done the will of God. And that's why so many fall in our generation. The character is not formed. Never learn to obey God never found the power of God in those revealed places. So when the unique place comes, they're so ill-equipped to face it. When the praise of man, the criticism of man, the lust of the eye or the pride of life or the lust of the flesh come, they're powerless against it because they've not done the will of God. They've just searched for this grand place, thinking somehow that's going to fulfill them. The Lord told me to study, to show myself approved unto God rightly dividing the word of God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. And I did study the word of God and I studied it with tears. I would read it, I would weep and I would read it again and read it again and read it again. I would read it sometimes the same verse over and over and over again until it would get deep into my spirit. I would read things that looked to be impossible only to find God speaking to my heart and saying, Yes, to you, impossible, but not to me. And I live inside of you, so let me be God to you. I would attend prayer meetings. I would go to work after feeding the animals. I would come home. I would go back to prayer meeting. And there was no time living on God. It was such a privilege to be in his house, such a privilege to be able to talk to him. I believed that God would give me the strength to be a good husband and a good father. And like Paul, 
I've not fully achieved everything, but I do press on to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I had to learn in secret to be unselfish because I was selfish to the core of my being when I came to Christ. I had to learn to love people. I remember pushing a shopping cart in a mall one time after becoming a Christian and I said out loud, I hate people. <laughs> you have to understand, I didn't want to be that way. But people had been a terrible source of pain in my life in the early years. And some of you know what that's all about. You understand that. And now you're called to be given for people. You're called to, to let them beat on you. You're called to love. It was hard for me when I started pastoring a church after having been a cop. There's a couple of times, I tell you, I darn near went across the desk at a couple of guys. I'm just being honest with you. Can I do that this morning? You have to be hard... You have to be kind to these people who wouldn't have said boo to you before you got saved. But after you're saved, oh, oh, oh. I had to learn to love when it seemed impossible. I had to help where I could when I saw a need. I had a guy call me one time and said, Pastor, I was in prayer this morning and God told me the greatness was going to be mine. I said, that's awesome, our janitor resigned this morning and I need somebody to clean the church. <laughs> and he said to me, that's not exactly what I had in mind. I said, no, I, I didn't think it was. <laughs> Although the Bible does say, the greatest among you will be your servant. Yes. Oh no, 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 I, that's not what I have in mind. And the unique will of God has been an incredible journey. And we're going to need to know that. We're going to have to come out of that upper room again. We're going to have to walk in the power of God in this generation. We're going to have to stand in the marketplace empowered by the Holy Spirit, uniquely called to be everything that God has called us to be. Because generic church attendance, as wonderful as that is, is not going to win this hour that we're now living in. We began in the upper room and we've got to finish in the upper room now as the church of Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you with all my heart that you learn to do the first things first. Do the first works. The first things. Come back to your first love if you need to. When you open this Bible, beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, you start reading it and say, God, don't let me read the Bible. Let the Bible read me. And Lord, where I fall short, let me trust you for the power and give me the will to do your will. Plant within me the desire to do your will. Give me the ability, oh God, to believe you and to change in those secret places from image to image and glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Don't let me live in this illusion that one day this mystical will of God's going to fall in my life when I am ignoring the revealed will of God. Help me, God, to take seriously your kingdom. Help me, Lord, to study your word. Help me to walk morally clean. Help me to pray. Help me, God, to be a good husband, a good father, a good wife, a good son, a good daughter. Help me to be honest in the workplace. Help me to care about people, oh God, in such an indifferent, selfish time that I find myself living in. Help me, God, to turn away from conversation, even in the media, that's simply going to bring me into a position of weakness. Help me to be a builder and not a destroyer. Oh, God, help me, Lord, to believe you for those things in my life that nobody but you and I know about. Help me to get the victory, oh, God, to walk honestly, to walk courageously, to walk victoriously with you. And then one day, one day, this strong impulse comes to my heart. And it's not necessarily where I'm the most comfortable. And it comes suddenly, sometimes. And even though I may put it away for a season, it will come back because God is patient. A day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day to him. And he doesn't forget. And he knows your struggle. He knows my struggle. He knows how hard we find it. 
like Gideon to believe that in our poverty, God can bring a marvelous victory through our lives. He knows how hard it is for Esther to feel unloving and unlovely to go into the king at the cost or potential price of her life to intercede for her people. He knows how hard it is for Moses after his natural strength is gone. He's no longer an eloquent speaker. His sword has gone out of his hand and only a stick is in his hand now. He knows how hard it is for us to believe that it's at this moment in our lives that the unique will of God comes to us. That specific calling through which we will glorify him. Oh, but thank God for those hidden places. Thank God for the victory in those secret places. Thank God for the courage to do the will of God. And it may be hard now, but when God calls you in that moment, that divine moment for your life, whether it's a long season or a short season, where through you he is glorified, uniquely through your life, you will thank God that you studied this word. You will thank God you went to prayer meetings. You will thank God you made right choices. You'll thank God you learned to speak the truth. You'll thank God that when it seemed impossible, you made the choice to go through the paper wall the devil put before you, and you trusted God for the victory, you will thank God at those moments in your life. This is the will of God, 1 Peter 2.15, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. This is the will of God. By doing good, by doing right, by speaking the truth, by caring in an uncaring time, by praying when nobody else prays, by studying when everyone else is writing off the word of God, by speaking the name of Jesus when everyone else wants to curse his name. This is the will of God. By being an honest employee in the workplace, by doing the books right, by speaking the truth where you go, by lifting up and not casting down, by walking away from evil conversation, that you put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. This is the will of God. This is where character is formed. This is where you find out whether or not you can play on the team and you can go into the arena. You don't win the battle in the locker room, you're not gonna win it on the field. You have gotta win it in secret before you win it in public. You will suddenly not be the super evangelist that loves everybody if you've not learned to love people in private. That's how it works. This is the will of God. And so don't worry about the unique will of God, that will come to you. You won't even be able to escape it. It will come. Today, think about the revealed will of God, the practical will of God. And you can get out from under this burden. Lord, what is your will? It's there. It's simple. It's real. And then when you finally get to the unique will of God, what if it doesn't even involve you? You ever thought of that? You study, you pray. And suddenly this, this unique moment in your life comes. Think about Joseph, <laughs> a godly man. And the unique moment came to his life and he said, I want you to marry this girl and, ra and help raise her son. And that was it for Joseph. What if the Lord said to you today, it's not about you, it's about your son or your daughter. I have a specific call on this child's life. I just want you to live a godly life before them and raise them in the fear of God. What if that is the will of God for you? Is that okay? Is that good enough? What if the specific will of God for your life is I want you to take a stand in the marketplace? I want you to live a godly life. You just don't know what it is, but I do know one thing. It's always, at least in my case, it's always been out of my comfort zone. I'm on radio now in 170 stations in 25 states calling this country back to God and back to prayer. It was hilarious when they tried to train me. You know, radio voice, to learn to be likable, friendly, <laughs> hopeless. I am who I am, I can't do it any other way. It's just I am who I am. That's my part of the bargain. It's Lord, take it or leave it. This is who I am. It's who you've made me. I challenge you with all my heart. 
I'm going to give an altar call this morning, and it's so simple. I will to do the will of God. God, give me the will to want to do your will. And everything from where I sit today to where you're going to take me before I die, give me the will to do your will. Don't let me think of anything as too small, too undignified, too beneath me. God, help me. God, help me. God, help me. Help me to be the one if there's a piece of paper on the floor to pick it up. God, help me to do your will. God, help me to be kind, truthful, faithful. God, help me to be a good husband, good wife, good son, good daughter, good employee, good citizen. God, help me to be a builder, not a destroyer. God, help me to be one promoting unity when the society is promoting division. God, help me to take a stand for truth when everyone else seems to be content to deal with lies. God, help me. Make me willing, Lord, to do your will. And if you should have something unique from my life, open my heart to it, God. Give me the courage. You'd be amazed. If, if you can lay hold of this truth this morning, you'd be amazed at where you're going to be 15 years from now, Lord, Lord willing and Lord tearing. You'd be amazed at what God's going to do in your life. Be amazed where he's going to take you and what he'll do through your life. Be amazed at the depth of prayer he'll give you, bring into your heart if that's his will for you to be an intercessor in this generation. But, oh, God, make me willing. Make me willing. If we truly heard this, responded to it, this church would explode into revival. There'd been an awakening here, the beggar's description. If that was truly the cry, truly the cry of your heart, Christ would become revealed to you in a way like you've never known him. Father, I thank you, God, for giving me the ability to speak this word. I've not stood here by might nor by power, but by your spirit. Lord, I ask you, God, in this last hour in which we live, this last season of humanity as we've known it, that you would give all of us the desire to do your will. Lord, you know it's hard. You yourself, Jesus, ask the Father to be somehow relieved of having to go to the full extent of his will. That's why you invite us in our trials and struggles. Thank you for your mercy. Give us grace, Lord. And we're going to worship just for a moment. And as we do, for every person here, North Jersey as well and at home, say, God, I want to will to do your will. I want you to give me that kind of a heart. If that's the cry of your heart, we're going to stand at a moment in the balcony. You can go to either exit. In the annex in North Jersey, you could step between the screens. I'm just going to ask you to come forward and let that be the single most cry of your heart. I want to will, oh God, to do your will. Plant within me the desire to obey you. What you've already revealed and then what you will uniquely call me to one day. God, give me the desire to obey your will. Let's stand, please. And if God's speaking to you, just come. Meet me here at this altar and we'll pray together in a moment. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just stretch your hands out, please? Lord, I just thank you, God, for strength for all of us, for every one of us, Lord, in this time in which we live, to not draw back. But we have come forward and we have said, I will to do your will. I will, Lord. You have to put within my heart that passion, the strength, the desire, and the victory. It has to all come from you, Lord. We recognize that. We are weak, but you are strong. Lord, thank you that 120 weak people went into an upper room and prayed 
and they wanted to do your will. And you came upon them as we sang like a rushing of a mighty wind. And even Rome bent its knee. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that we have such a heritage. Guide us now into your revealed will. Help us, Lord, not to find excuses to disobey you. Give us the grace to do what you've called us to do. And open our hearts, Lord, when that, that divine calling for each of us comes. Give us the courage to obey it. Thank you for it. Thank you, God, for what you're about to do in this time. Praise you for it and bless you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.